There it is. <laughs> I hope he's okay. <laughs> he likes it. That's a little wet and I'm not that brave. Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today on this beautiful snowy day, we're driving the Acura NSX. This is a 2020 model and that matters because when it launched in 2017, it didn't exactly wow everybody. Oh, but this actually is one of my favorite features. When you open the door, <laughs> the door handles come out. But anyway, in 2017, when this car launched, it was much awaited. There was so much anticipation for the successor to the original NSX, which is renowned as one of the greatest driver's cars of all time. And it was designed to set out to beat Ferrari. It was supposed to come after the 348 and 355, F355, I should say. And when this NSX came out, it had staggering numbers. And of course it was fast, but it never really got the recognition it deserved. And now that I'm driving it in its 2020 form, and a lot of updates have been made since 2019. If you really want to nerd out, you could spend hours reading about what the engineers did and changed, but the public never responded to it in, in, in the big way that I think Honda and Acura wanted them to do. And you know, it's been touted as the daily driver supercar. It's a hybrid. This is a three and a half liter twin turbo V6 with three electric motors. There's a TMU or twin motor unit up front, which can send torque to both wheels up front individually, both positively and negatively, which means that in a corner can actually decelerate or break that inside wheel and accelerate that outside wheel to give you a little bit of yaw. In the back, it has a direct drive motor that will help assist those rear wheels. All in, you're at 573 horsepower, and that's nothing to scoff at, especially with a zero to 60 time of about 2.9 seconds. It's really, really fast, but it was touted as the daily drive supercar, the reliable one, the car you don't have to worry about. But the problem is there's not a whole lot of storage space. Let's go to the frunk or lack thereof. This doesn't have any storage up here. This is radiators, cooling fans, and that's it. I mean, really, this is this is unusable space for anybody. And if you are a Porsche person or a McLaren person, you're used to having a little bit of storage up front. Unlike its predecessor, this does not compete with Ferrari, it mostly competes with the Audi R8, the McLaren 570S, and the Porsche 911 Turbo. And if you are in the market for something like this, the Turbo has back seats, or at least back storage space. And in here, all you really get is this very small trunk that has a big hump in here that's not an accident. I think there's probably some exhaust or something going on there. I'm not actually sure what's under it, but you know, you have this somewhat cavernous sides, but really you can get a, a set of golf clubs and not a whole lot else. But you could indeed use this as your everyday car. It's pretty normal to use. And as long as you're not trying to carry a whole bunch of stuff, it's very comfortable and easy to drive. This one's outfitted with the carbon ceramic brakes up front, which are beautiful, especially with just the gray calipers. And these are my favorite wheels, the Y spokes. They make some more forward thinking, futuristic looking wheels. They don't really do it for me, but you know what? We gotta take it out for a drive because it is a blast to drive. And we have it on Soto Zero snow tires, 245s in the front, 305s in the rear. We'll see what happens with a little bit of slip. Let's start it up. It fires to life with some aggression. This V6 sounds incredible. I mean, obviously that's what we expect from Honda. Honda always makes great engines and we would expect nothing less from them, especially on their flagship brand. Let's turn this down just a little bit. All right. But there's distinct modes that this car has. So number one is quiet mode. It's going to give us the ability to drive extra, extra quietly, and it's gonna do its best to keep it in EV mode if it can. So that means when you're pulling in your driveway and stuff, it's super quiet. Then we have sport mode, sport plus, and if you hold it over to the right, you end up in track mode, and it tells us ready and traction off. Traction's never really off in this car. We'll get to that when we drive. But first, let's just give it a little rev. The central interface is really nice. It's super easy to use. You have your park, reverse, neutral, and drive. Everything in the car is super intuitive. But now, <laughs> pressure building up from that twin turbo V6. Those turbos sound phenomenal. Can't get it into first gear. If you want to downshift it from second to first, you're not gonna do it. 
This thing is so sure-footed. I think that's what you notice the most about it. Very mechanical sound to these downshifts to this to this engine. I'm seeing a ton of oil on the ground here. Got to be careful. So let's try to just talk about this car on its own, independent of other cars for a minute. It's so natural to jump in and drive this. And yes, it's a bit heavy, 3,800 pounds. And you notice the weight, that's not insignificant. It would be nice if this was kind of in that 3,200 to 3,300 pound range, but you know, technology isn't or wasn't there for what they wanted to do in this car. Steering is super fast, but precise, and it's not too fast. Sometimes when you get into this territory, you start to exaggerate things. And I'm looking at Audi. All right, you know what? We are gonna talk about other cars. I'm looking at Audi and Lamborghini here. Their steering is so quick. I haven't driven enough new Ferraris to really bring them into the fold with this, but I know that you get in a Huracan or an R8, and sometimes the steering just feels artificially fast. It's a little much. This car doesn't really feel like that. It's clearly a quick rag but it's not so fast that you unintentionally turn in too quickly. So with all the performance and objectively real world usability, minus the storage space in the car, why aren't people buying this? Why aren't we talking about this more? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, it's a Honda. People don't wanna buy $200,000 Hondas the same way they didn't wanna buy a Phaeton. The Phaeton was basically a Bentley Continental with a Volkswagen badge on it. And even though it was a phenomenal car, barring its reliability issues, people didn't want it. They just didn't buy it. They could not, they could not splurge basically six figures for a Volkswagen. And I think, I, I really do think that that's a limiting factor for Honda. And that's not Honda's fault. But you have to think about it pragmatically. What's the average Honda buyer spending, right? Like forty to $50,000, something along those lines. What's the average McLaren, Porsche, Ferrari, Audi even buyer spending? Those companies already have a Rolodex full of people who have $200,000, $250,000 to drop on a car at a moment's notice just to trade in their old one for the new one. Honda doesn't really have that, which means that they have to take they have to take customers away from those OEMs. They have to go in, now ah, that's a snowy lot. Let's go find out if we can have a little bit of fun in there. They have to try to take customers away from Porsche and Lamborghini and McLaren. That's not an easy task, especially when you're already loyal to that brand. So what I wanna know is, does this traction control system turn off? Like, will it allow me to actually get slip? So let's put it in track mode. Gonna go the extra distance on this to make sure that this is off. And let's just see what happens. We'll give it a little bit of turn. Okay. Can you get an Acura NSX sideways in the snow? Apparently, the answer is yes. Now, there's a lot going on. I can feel traction control doing things in the background. So I'm not on my own here. It's helping me quite a bit, but if you're wondering, like, can you do a donut and get some slip angle in it? The answer is yes. I'm floored. And it's not really letting me do much. There it is. I hope he's okay. <laughs> he likes it. All right, that's good. As long as the people, as long as the people in the parking lots who you're doing donuts with like you I think you're in good shape so we've answered that question but Honda ultimately gave themselves the task of stealing customers away from major brands with a car that really was different than those cars. And I only say that because I like the car. I genuinely enjoy driving this. I feel happy, I feel joy. Indy Yellow Pearl, mm, you gotta get this in yellow, I swear to God. This is the color for the car. 
and people people feel the sense of community with the car. I get I get amazing looks and stares. People seem very happy when they see it. They, all the Honda Acura boys, they are they are they're breaking their necks. That dude doesn't know what it is. They were just doing donuts in his parking lot. He has no idea what this is. He's just happy because a bright yellow supercar is doing donuts. I think we should get a picture of this with the school buses. You can't have a car this color and not get a photo of it with a big line of school buses. What's the angle? How do we approach this? I think, I think I've got it. I think I know what I want. If you're gonna paint a car like a school bus, you've gotta photograph it with the school buses. Oh yes, that's so good. That is so good. This is the new school. What would Miss Frizzle drive? I think she might drive this. Let's put it in track mode and try a little launch control. I've been told track mode, Put on the brake, floor it, it'll say it's doing the thing, and off you go. We've got wet roads, nobody behind us, carbon ceramics, let's just stand on them. Absolutely phenomenal! Not a whole lot of pedal feel like I said because it's brake by wire, but my goodness, does she get down in a hurry. I know for some people, hybrid is a four letter word. <laughs> it's, it's a bad thing. Oh my goodness, a hybrid? No, we don't want hybrids, except that this makes the car faster. It makes it perform better. It means that no matter what, when that light turns green, I'm probably gonna get ahead of whoever's next to me. I mean, it's a forerunner, we're fine, but. Torque fill is just nuts. Being a little cautious just because it's wet. You're gonna tell me that that doesn't sound like a supercar? By the way, yes, it's piping in sound, but it's not piping in sound with audio through the speakers. There's actually pipes there's a pipe back there and there's a 25 decibel difference between quiet mode and sport or track mode so it does get louder in the cabin but not because it's artificial it's i mean it's just actually opening up a valve in a pipe on the highway though let's just you know take a minute to appreciate the fact that in quiet mode at 70 miles an hour NVH is like nothing. This car is screwed together really well. It has 16,000 miles on it, by the way. Let's not forget that. This is a press car that has definitely been through the ringer. I have done one launch control in it. I'm sure it's done a thousand. But you can get on the highway like a complete psycho listening to some of the most beautiful V6 sounds I've ever heard. And then you can get on the highway, put it in quiet mode, set cruise control, and 78 miles an hour, 2200 RPM in ninth gear, just chugging along. An odd thing this car doesn't have is when you set the cruise control, it doesn't come up and tell you, oh, I've set it to 77 miles per hour. This actually is like an old school cruise control where you just hold it and wait until it gets to the speed you want and then let it go. And as far as I know, there's no radar guidance or anything like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but this seems pretty rudimentary in that department. And that's where I can see when you're like, hey man, daily driven supercar, shouldn't it have some of these features? The thing that makes this car so drivable though is the visibility. Uh, yes, it's mid-engine, so you lose a big chunk of visibility from that C-pillar, but it's not that bad because they've put it so far back and you've still got this little window back there. These side mirrors, not only do they look fantastic, I do wish they were electric. They don't fold in automatically when you lock the car. I think that would have been a nice feature, but they're nice and far out, so they go beyond the scoops and you can see everything. And they're big mirrors. They didn't go cheap on this. I hate it when supercars put these little baby mirrors and you're like, dude, I already can't see out of the car. And now, now you're just making it for style choices for me to have less visibility. Oddly enough, one of my favorite features of this car is the fact that it can run on electric power alone. So when you're just at low speeds and you're cruising around, it can go just electric, which is wicked cool. I don't know, man. I know, like, look, I love internal combustion engines. I'm not trying to say like, I want hybrid future, but, and look at this, assisting the charge, regen braking, but it's really cool to be able to just run silently when you want to. 
the problem with this car though is that it's not a plug-in hybrid so you don't get the benefit of being able to get basically free power from your uh, your outlet at home let's say you're running on solar you don't get to do that but anyway enough of that let's have more fun let's get on the highway in sport plus mode that's a little wet and i'm not that brave traction control kicking in, stability control keeping me stable. But make no mistake, this is a supercar. This is supercar performance. It's not supercar weight, and I think that's the big knock against it. 3,800 pounds, not great, but let's, let's take it in for a second. This is basically a baby 918, a baby Porsche 918. And the 918 Spyder was 3,600 pounds. Not exactly a lightweight either. And those are going for like $1.52 million right now. This is $155,000, $157,000 starting price. Let's say all in, new, you're at 195 to 200. Am I saying it's a bargain? No, but am I saying that this is like a phenomenal entry-level supercar that maybe approaches a slightly different demographic than the typical shouty V12, V8, or the more practical flat six in the Porsche 911 Turbo? Yeah, I don't know, man. I'll tell you what. If you gave me the keys to the 911 Turbo and this, as long as I didn't have to like pack a bunch of stuff and go on vacation, I think I'm gonna choose this. I don't know. I haven't driven the new 992 Turbo yet, so I can't say 100%, but I've driven the C4S, and yeah, it, it, they're very pragmatic, they're very practical cars, almost to a fault, almost to the point where they're a little boring. So here's my final thoughts. Look, when this came out, I'll be honest, I wasn't, I wasn't sold. I wasn't somebody who looked and said, I, that's my dream car, that's what I wanna drive, that's what I wanna buy, that's what I wanna own. I wasn't that guy, and the photos genuinely didn't do it justice. I didn't even really like the colors that it was coming out in. Something about this yellow instantly just ugh, like broke my brain. I'm like, wait a minute, I need to take a closer look at this thing. And driving this car on the street for the first time has really opened my eyes to what this thing can do. Is it a track car? No! No, I, I don't think so. I mean, could you bring it to the track and enjoy yourself and have a lovely day? Absolutely. I don't think this serves the purpose of a GT3 or a GT3 RS. While it could certainly lay down some exciting lap times, it is, it is a bit heavy, um, and I just don't really see that as the purpose. But that doesn't mean that every supercar has to be a track car. I, I don't look at a Countach and say, hey, that was a great track car, or a, or a Ferrari Testarossa, hey, that was a great track car. No, those were supercars, but they weren't track cars. I think this is a little more nimble for sure and tactile than those cars. Um, but I see this as the daily driver supercar. The car that you're not so worried about getting in and out of every day, that you're not worried about braking, that you know is gonna start for you, and then you're not worried about putting miles on it. Supercars typically have a shelf life of like 10,000 miles. When you get to that 95,000 mile time, they're like, oh my God, we gotta sell this now before the depreciation hits. Look, is this gonna depreciate for sure? But I genuinely think if you buy one of these, you're gonna to wanna to drive it for 100,000 miles. So, don't sleep on the NSX. Don't hate on the NSX until you've driven one. So, thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Give the NSX a chance, man. This thing is cool. We're out here driving it on Soto Zeros in the winter. It does speak volumes that Actor is willing to put this on snow tires and send it into New England during the winter months. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one. Acura needs to follow through with the NSX R. They need to make a Type R of this car 100%.